how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking to me. It's a pleasure to speak to you uh, to speak to you and meet you. Oh my gosh. Thank you for like reaching out and wanting to do this. I really appreciate it. And also thank you so much for a fantastic book. I, I mean, I thought you see my review already at the trees group because I believe this it is such a fantastic, uh, and I'd never actually read anything written by you before. So this was the first thing I read and it was, it was just, you had me hooked from the, from wow, the very first story. You. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That means a lot. I really like that book is really special to me. So it means a lot when people, you know, respond so positively to it. Uh -huh. So I, mean, I was looking up a little bit about the kind of the, the background for the, those these specific short stories. And it was originally, it went by another title, I think, when it released in the US. And then it's in the UK through Titan Books that is released through the name of one of the other stories, no? When yeah. you actually came up with these stories, were they all, was it like a like a, an album, so to speak? Was it something that you wanted to create as a kind of accumulation of, of very similarly seemed topics but kind of that went ran through from very young young a young age to kind of like older people and sort of kind of real realizing mortality and then maybe the death of parents was that all always in in your uh was that always your intention to to kind of go through the whole lifespan but kind of have a central theme throughout oh definitely yeah i mean i wrote like a lot of those stories um, funnily enough, when I was like first falling in love with my boyfriend who um, like I live with now, uh, we were just starting out and uh, I had just graduated from uh, grad school and we were like living together in Cambridge and then like the pandemic hit and we were just like, you know, like really discovering each other as people. And um, I, I really wanted to write a like a collection of stories that really focused on just like relationships and like human relationships and our relationships with love and life in general and death. Um, and I just, I, I kind of spent like a lot of the, some of the stories were written pre-pandemic, like a couple, maybe three, two or three were written pre-pandemic, but pretty much all of them were written, uh, you know, while the pandemic was happening. Um, and I was just really filled with like a lot of intrusive thoughts about like my own mortality, my own like relationship with my partner, um, how I view myself and how I view other people. Um, and that was kind of like the springboard for how this book came to be. And like you mentioned, it was originally published uh, with a small press. Uh, called Off Limits Press, and the book right. was called The Strange Thing We Become and Other Dark Tales. Um, and then that particular press uh, had some shifting in the editorial department, and I was able to get the rights back to the book. And at the time that that was happening, I was developing a relationship with Titan Books in the UK. And my agent, uh, once I got the rights back to the collection, my agent sent the manuscript to Titan, uh, and they were like, "We absolutely must publish this. We love it." Um, and, and Titan it, are just huge fans because um, we'll talk about other things that they're going to do soon. But I mean, Titan just publish everything they can of yours. They're obviously huge fans of yours. Yeah, yeah, they they've been so awesome to work with. Like, I absolutely love my editor. Her name's Kath. Um, she's just like the kindest. Like, just also like a very gentle person and like very like. I'm very sensitive when it comes to my writing. So I kind of need somebody to kind of shepherd me and guide me, but gently. Um, I don't like really aggressive editing. <laughs> you know what I right. mean? Like I like, I like, I love editing and like collaborating, but yeah. I like when editors like ask questions and when they kind of like gently lead you toward a realization that you weren't thinking before. Right, um, rather than kind of putting have, words into your mouth or making you say things that you wouldn't otherwise want to, to say and all right. that kind of thing, yeah. Exactly, and Kath is exactly like that. Like, she's very, um, very thoughtful, very reflective, but, you know, she guides me to answers that I wasn't originally thinking of, you know what I mean? Um, so the Titan's just been great to work with, and like you said, they, um, they've picked up pretty much all of my material and... Uh, they've actually bought a couple other projects that I haven't announced yet. Um, like that's going to be published in like 
2025, 2026, and 2027. Oh. So I'm pretty much like with Titan for the long run, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm not surprised you're thinking about mortality and things like that already because you got, you're in it for the long run already, yeah. But no, I mean, just, yeah. but at, the same, at the same time, I, mean, I, I mentioned that, that these these feel very, very close. They're almost all siblings, the stories in, in this book. But at the same time, they're very... They're very thematically similar, but they're also they're, they're very different in terms of the the subgenres that you've written them in, because mm-hmm. obviously your your trademark for a lot of your fans is that you're very kind of body horror, very pure horror, and there are yep. some in here. But this also goes on to kind of really roller coaster thriller rides, some very yep. poignant yep. stories. Um, was that always your intention as well to kind of was to to deviate slightly from the the pure horror and bring some other things in there just to kind of bring new things into the mix but at the same time was it difficult was it a difficult balance for you to kind of keep this uh, pure horror and these thriller all in the same book yeah I'm really glad that you picked up on that because I think the strength of any fiction collection is like if it's diverse enough but also that it's not too different so the stories have to be they have to like interact with one one another in some way but not be so a like that a reader feels like they're reading the same story over and over again. Um, I like my favorite collections are books that have that diversity and they have those stories that are communicating with one another, but they're very different. They're very like, you know, eclectic. Um, you know, I'm thinking of ke- collections, um, you know, Books of Blood obviously is a major one for me. Like I love Clive Barker. Right. Um, I'm trying to think. Michael Weehunt, Greener Pastures. That's another great collection. Um, yeah, I mean, there are tons of collections. That, and actually, I was reading a lot of Roald Dahl uh, really? while okay. I was writing uh, these stories. And I I think Roald Dahl is just such an exceptional storyteller. Mm-hmm. And just his way of, it's, he's just like so elegant, so classy with presenting a story to the reader and I really wanted to like capture that elegance with my own pieces in this collection but more to the to answer more of your question I absolutely was you know trying to bring that diversity to the collection without without making the stories seem like they're they're not like they're not connected with one another and in such a way like but I also wanted to give readers like a taste of maybe future uh, genres that I'm kind of looking to dabble in. So mm-hmm. the last story in the collection, I feel like that's that was a great note for me to end on for this particular book, because it's not necessarily the body horror that people have come to know from me. It's more like just very dark, bleak fiction and that's kind of the direction that I would like to go in eventually is just kind yeah. of not necessarily that like overt in your face body horror, but just more like somber, reflective, um, just very bleak, minimal horror. Almost I maybe even like quiet horror would be a, a way to describe it um, where there aren't like where it's like the mood of the piece is really important, you know, like the yeah, tone absolutely. of the piece. Yeah, because I felt um, a lot of the, a lot of these stories. Sorry to interrupt you, but some of the uh, the stories here. What I appreciate about the ones that were less horror and less kind of body horror were the fact that it, it made it kind of instilled the horror in whilst I was reading in me. The mm-hmm. kind of the feelings and when you mentioned Roald Dahl, a lot of the when I was a kid when I used to read Roald, read Roald Dahl books, his the way that he expressed himself and it just you could you just got right inside his head and you could just feel exactly what he was feeling. And that was very much in the case with some of these stories here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm a huge uh, Roald Dahl fan. And, um, you know, he was definitely in my mind quite a bit when I was working on these stories. Um, but I mean, I'm a student of, uh, you know, like just dark fiction in general, like Kelly Link, um, David Demchuk, um, just really, I love anything that's very bleak and, uh, you know, not necessarily in your face. Like I do love that kind of shock horror, like, you know, where that you find with like Clive Barker and Poppy Z. Bright and Kathy Koja, like the splatterpunk movement. And I've definitely like worked in that wheelhouse for a while, but 
this collection was more of my attempt to kind of explore further regions from the splatterpunk and like the body horror subgenres and really just dabble in like maybe even more like literary type fiction like the last yeah. story in the book like please leave or i'm going to hurt you that last story i mean you could absolutely classify that as just like literary fiction yeah. you know as opposed to just horror um so i was definitely trying to kind of flex my writer muscles and just see what i could kind of get away with with this collection and um you know as i said like it's very personal uh very very near and dear to my heart um a lot of the a lot of the stories so i'm always like really grateful when anybody reads it and has like a a visceral reaction to it i think for, for me out of all the stories the one that I had the most visceral reaction from i don't know maybe it's because i resonated with the actual character themselves was the story um bodies of a burning so I've, mm -hmm. I've suffered with depression and, and uh, social anxiety these kind of things since i was a kid and so just to read this person and you really kind of got into the 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 the, the mindset of this person and, and all these thoughts that, that they, they go through that and the the automatic negative thoughts that they have to deal with every day um how personal was that for you and, and how did you research that or how how, how if, if it was very personal that must have been very complicated to write in a book knowing that other people are going to read about that no obviously a very important yeah. subject to share with people that to, to make them realize that that's something that uh they aren't suffering alone, no? But at the same time, it must yeah. be very hard to put something like that into words onto into a book that you know is going to be be published for millions of people to read. Yeah, and I'm I'm going to get a little personal here, and I, I apologize if I overstep in any way, but I mean, that, that story is very personal to me for many reasons. Um, in 2020 or 2021, I was diagnosed with OCD, um, and I suffer, I still suffer from like intrusive thoughts. Um, they're not, they're not as bad as they once were, but when I was first diagnosed and was uh, really kind of in the thick of it and really suffering from these just awful, awful thoughts, um, it was the most frightened I had ever been in my life. Um, and it was, it was, it was like living in a nightmare constantly and I was afraid of myself for the first time in my life I had never been you know afraid of me and my own body my own mind yeah. and it really showed me how we can be like we can be our own worst enemy we can be like the creator of our own destruction and downfall um so when I wrote that piece, I was kind of, I was, you know, kind of on the way out from it. You're never fully recovered from that type of diagnosis and, and suffering from those kind of thoughts, but um, they weren't as prominent in my mind when I was writing the story. So I was able to kind of separate myself from the thoughts that I was having and just write this piece uh, the way I wanted it to. But it was a very like, it was a very personal experience. It was very difficult to write at times. And there were times that I I questioned even including it in the collection because I thought to myself, I don't know if I want to put this out there. I don't know if I want people to know this about me. Rather, like I didn't know if I wanted to even put that kind of darkness out into the world. Um, but it felt it felt also very freeing to write in a lot of ways. And that story is one of my favorite pieces I've written because of it, how personal it is for me. Um, so that particular piece, it's early on in the collection. It kind of, it kind of sets the tone for like the rest of the collection because the first story uh, you follow wherever they go is quite gentle and uh, not really like not that dark. But then once you end that piece, the first story, you go into bodies are for burning. And that's just kind of like a sledgehammer right to your face, you know, like it's it's very assaulting. And I kind of wanted it to be like that because that's how those thoughts felt when I was experiencing them at that time. They felt 
I felt like I was so powerless. I thought like I just had like the wind knocked out of me. And these thoughts were just coming at me like night and day. And I just could not turn them off. Um, so the placement of the story in that collection is also very particular and very specific. Um, so I would want readers to know that as well. But um, I look back on that story and I've definitely grown, uh, you know, I've developed mentally since then. And I'm, you know, working with uh, like a therapist and working on my mental health every day. Um, so I feel like I've come a long way and that's like a, a like a perfect little time capsule of like what I was going through at that time, you know, and it's almost mm -hmm. kind of, it's, I get kind of sentimental thinking about it and looking back at that um, because I, I feel, I feel sadness for that person. Um, but I also, I also feel free looking at that person and, and remembering like who I was, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if there's any consolation for me, I felt it was one of the strongest stories and it really, I felt it was a story that needs to be told because I mean, I couldn't say, speak from someone who hasn't suffered, but I mean, for having suffered similar um, symptoms myself, it just felt so truth. And so it, it showed that despite people having such horrible and disgusting thoughts, all that the, the, the protagonist was concerned about was the, the, the benefit of the welfare of everybody else. And it just yeah. really, really touched. It was a really touching story in the end. In the end of the, that's why when I in my review, I said that all of these stories here, despite how dark they go, they're always uplifting and, and touching and kind of remind us how beautiful we are as people, even though we go into these really dark places, no? That means a lot. And that's what I've really tried to convey with, especially that story was that when you're going through those thoughts, I, like in my experience, I was worried about other people. I I was scared of myself and these thoughts that I was having, but I was worried about the well-being of other people. And I think that, I hope that that comes through in that piece. And I hope it shows that there is like a semblance of hope for just humanity in general. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that was exactly what, something that I really picked up from all of the stories was the idea that, that uh, no matter how dark everything is, there it was there is some kind of hope somewhere. There was a silver lining. Yeah. So there was a, there was like a silver lining to this black cloud all all the way through the book, yeah, which I loved. Right. Absolutely, that means a lot. Thank you, thank uh -huh. you. So I mean, also I mean, one that was one one of the pure horror stories. The other horror horror, horror story that was very Cronenberg esque, if that's the word that exists, was um the trees. The name of the uh, the book, the trees grew because I bled there. Um, that also had kind of an inspirational message at the same time. This was one of the stories that really kind of brought in the idea of, of parenting, which is something that plays heavily in the, in the whole book as in the book as a whole as well. Was there any specific reason why you wanted to, to deal with parenting in this book? Because it, it, it is dealt with in quite a few uh, stories in this book. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I, I don't have any children, so I come at it from a very different perspective in that, parenting seems to me like the ultimate gift you can give another person. Uh, you know, it's a responsibility that I would not take very lightly. Um, it seems like the ultimate sacrifice in a lot of ways, but it also, like I said, it does seem like a very important gift to like nurture another human being and raise them and uh, educate them let them learn about the world and, you know, watch them grow. And I know a lot of people can relate to that. I know a lot of horror readers are parents themselves. And, uh, you know, my own feelings just about parenthood, coupled with the fact that I expect, you know, horror fiction really resonates with people when it's something that they can identify with on some level. And, so I was thinking from like a writer perspective, like what are people going to really identify with in these stories? Um, but then I also was thinking on the other side, you know, just relationships in general, what are really powerful relationships? And I think the relationship between, you know, 
father and son, mother and son, mother and daughter, father and daughter, like those relationships are so vital to like just fully forming and like becoming a human being um, that if anything goes wrong in in that situation, it seems like the ultimate horror. Um, and I mean, thankfully I have very great relationships with, with my parents. Um, it wasn't always, you know, roses and sunshine, but um, you know, my parents and I definitely understand one another now and we're kind of in a, a, a really great place and they're just so supportive and um, so kind. They've always been very supportive of me and like my dreams to tell stories. Um, but that relationship, it's very complex. And I like exploring those kind of complex relationships in fiction. I think that's where really compelling drama lies. Um, you know, and a lot of these stories, they are horror, but I also think of them as like little plays, like little drama, you know, like uh, you're not supposed to be here. That, I mean, I, I sent that to my manager uh, before the, the collection was published and he was like, oh, I could definitely see this as like a like a play, like on a stage somewhere. It could even be a know? film or a short film. Yeah, it was a fantastic. It was, it was the, the, the most kind of gripping story of the yeah. book, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I, I, I look at it from a theatrical lens as well. Just, you know, what's going to be the most compelling drama, dramatic way to tell this story. And, you know, parent-child relationships are often fraught with drama. And um, you know, sacrificing and uh, maybe misunderstandings, um, anything like that. So that to me is is really fascinating. And I, I think that that's why I gravitated toward the parent-child relationship so much with this book. Mm -hmm. And what, one, was, one, one uh, story that was particularly uh, intriguing for me was the, when you had, the, what was the name of it called now? Um... Where flames burn at Emerald Grass, I think it was, where the yeah. father, he'd recently, he was a recently widowed father. I don't want to give too much away, but he was concerned about his daughter not having a maternal figure. Was that mm -hmm. something that, that, was, that plays on, was playing on your mind at the time? Was there any specific reason why you wanted to, to, figure, to, to focus a story specifically on a father's concerns about there not being a maternal figure in a family? Because it's not, it's I mean, not just... something that's necessary. Right. Yeah, it's absolutely not necessary. I think I come at it from a very different perspective in that, you know, I am queer and my, uh, you know, I'm in a relationship with, um, you know, a, a man. So the two of us, if we ever did like adopt a child or, um, you know, have a surrogate, uh, you know, the child would have two fathers and there wouldn't be like that mother figure. And that because I have such a close relationship with my own mother, I wonder, I do wonder my hypothetical child, if that would be a detriment to them in some way, you know what I mean? So that's why I think that story, it like preys on my mind a little bit. I know that it's probably unfounded and that, you know, I, like there are single, there are single parents, there are, families with uh like two moms two dads maybe a grandparent maybe an aunt or an uncle there i mean there's so many it's very diverse like guardians of of children um but my own experience that's what is that's what i fixate on is just thinking of you know my own situation and bringing that into the story because i feel like you know, I hate the I hate the advice like write what you know because you obviously can't know everything and you have to like invent some aspects of your story. You can't write like autobiographies all the time. But any chance that I can insert my own emotion and my own feeling into a piece, I feel like it makes it a little bit richer. Um, at least I hope it does. Oh, so. Definitely. So that's where it comes from in in that particular story. I mean, the the way you're speaking about these things, I mean, these are these are all things that you've obviously you know a lot about them because you've suffered a lot of these things. You know, you mentioned there about having suffered OCD all these all these all these years. 
I'm hoping that this book has served as some kind of catharsis for you of, of, over the course of the writing. I imagine so. It's been, yeah, this book has meant a lot to me for many years. And I was, um, you know, when it first came out, it kind of fell under the radar because uh, my novella, Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke, had kind of blown up and yeah. was really popular on TikTok and, uh, you know, it was just like a viral book uh, online. And this book kind of fell under the radar. And then when we got the rights back um, and I sold it to Titan, like this is kind of like a rebirth of the book, I feel. And I, I really hope that this book finds a readership. I hope it finds people that need it. Um, I like, I love, I love everything I write and I, I wouldn't release it if I didn't care about it in some way or identify with what I'm trying to say with with the book that I'm releasing but this particular book like just holds a lot of value for me because it's so personal right. and because these stories like even as I'm talking to you right now like I'm realizing things about myself that are in that book that I subconsciously like put in there like the like the story of where flames burn emerald as grass like i i don't necessarily know if at the time i was thinking specifically of that and that reason why i put that in the story but as i talk to you it makes total sense why i put that in there so it has been hugely cathartic for me to write these stories but also just to see like the reaction to from people and you know, I feel like books find the readers that they're meant to. Readers find the books that they're supposed to, like, love and enjoy. Uh, and I really hope that this book reaches a lot of people because I really believe in this in this collection. Uh -huh. And someone who's a huge believer in your books, of course, is your mother, who on social media, you've posted a few photographs with, with the books. Yeah. One, yeah. One, I really want to, I mean, I don't hope you don't mind uh, me asking you a question about your mother. I don't, I don't like digging into people's personal life, but I'm, I'm curious. There's one specific story in here that um, talks, I'll be gone by then, that talks specifically about a, an estranged mother who comes from, I yes. think it was Italy, was it? Is that right? Yes. Um, yeah. And the, the son has some rather unusual thoughts running through their mind um i imagine i imagine your mom reads everything your mom reads everything that you, you she write does. she's she read How that she story feel when she read things like that because those those must be quite quite hard to to, to read from 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 this from your son now to write to, to read a story about these kind of thoughts of, of a son thinking about her mother in that way it's so funny you mentioned that because that's actually her favorite story from this her favorite story <laughs> it's her favorite <laughs> really? story she absolutely loves that story and she's so she's so just transfixed by that story and like the ending i don't want to go into spoiler territory but you know no, the ending just saves the everything ending. that like it goes before it of course but, I, but it just goes down such a dark place it's very similar to the to the one i talked about um bodies are for burning that he, he the thought processes and throughout yeah. there are just so terrifying but obviously re everything is redeemed in the end but it must have been very very Hard for right. your mother to read something like that and think, what, what what's my son thinking about here? I I I think she's able to like separate me from the work, which right. oh some people like really cannot separate like the art from the artist. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know where I stand on that issue, to be perfectly honest, because I feel like there are some authors that are deserving of you know, being held accountable for what they say online and, you right. know, their viewpoints. But then on the other hand, you know, the art is a separate entity from them. It obviously came from them, but it's not literally it's them. Fiction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a piece of fiction. But I think my mom is really able to just to get back to like the point of, of what you were trying to say. Like, I think my mom really is able to separate me from the fiction and she also just really enjoys like horror and thriller dark type material so I think she gets really jazzed whenever I she, she, I know she does get really jazzed whenever I send her like a new short story or a new book to read it just like really excites her 
Um, okay. So I think, yeah, I she's definitely like my biggest fan and I I don't know what I would do without her. And I don't blame you. No, she's obviously a fantastic fan because there's, there's, there's so many photographs and you can see she's so happy with all of the, all of the things that you uh, you put out there. It's fantastic. So listen, I don't want to keep you too long. So, I mean, I mentioned earlier that T Titan Books is a, a big fan of... Uh, all of your work, and I know that you've got just recently uh, revealed that you're going to be releasing a new. Is, is it your first full novel? I think no, called yes. "Everything the yeah. Darkness Eats," which I cannot get wait to get my hands on. What can you yeah. tell us about that book, and uh, how long has that how long has that been in the uh, in the pipeline? It's been in the pipeline for a while. I wrote that book like right after I wrote "Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke." So I wrote "Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke" like end of 2020. And I wrote Everything the Darkness Eats in like January 2021, February 2021, like those two months. And that particular book is, uh, like you mentioned, like my first full length novel. And it's set in a fictional town that I've kind of introduced in some of my shorter fiction called Henley's Edge, Connecticut. And in this town, uh, there are like several just kind of bizarre disappearances. People are kind of being abducted and and uh, local law enforcement is trying to kind of decipher what's happening. Meanwhile, we're following kind of all these other lives that are being interwoven with each other and kind of results in this just gruesome showdown at the end. Uh, and just kind of the, the whole book is basically about small town lives, how difficult it can be to be queer, openly queer in these you know, conservative communities. Yeah. Uh, it's about trauma. It's about grieving, uh, losing, losing loved ones. A lot of the themes that I explored in the trees grew because I bled there. I'm, I'm also still exploring in, in this particular book. So uh, that's coming out from clash in June uh, oh, yeah. in the U S and then it comes out from Titan in July. That's right. Third of July. Yeah. Titan 20th of July in clash books. That's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, perfect. And um, what can you tell me briefly? What was how was the transition? I mean, obviously, I'm sure you've you've written more shorts, and you're probably preparing various novels yes. over the course of the last few years. But what was the kind of the transition from writing shorts to coming up with a, a full a full length novel, and why why this specific story for your first full length your debut novel? I think you know it was difficult at first because I kind of thrive in the short story you know, framework. I like telling stories in condensed formats. I like small cast of characters. I, I, uh, I started writing primarily writing for theater when I was really young. Okay. So I, my whole upbringing, my whole education is based in playwriting. So my thoughts are, how can I tell this story in a contained location with as limited characters as possible? That's just how my brain works because I study playwriting for so long. And that's kind of informed a lot of my short fiction. But expanding into a novel, you kind of have all this freedom. You can, you know, have as many characters as as, as possible. Obviously, you want your reader to be able to follow along. Uh, but you really have like that kind of freedom that you don't get with smaller narratives. Um, so that in and of itself was a huge draw. Uh, it was also a little bit of a draw back for me because like I said, like I really thrive in that shorter condensed framework. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as far as like why this particular novel, um, I, I think it, I think it speaks to a lot of the previous themes that I had been exploring in a lot of my other work. Like, like I mentioned, like trauma, um, you know, bigotry is a big one in this particular book, like hate crimes, um, especially crimes against LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. folks. Um, I I feel like we're, you know, living in a time where speaking out about those things is more crucial than ever. Uh, and for this book to kind of go to those dark places and kind of explore the horrible things that happen to queer people just all over the world. It's not just in the microcosm of this fictional town, Henley's Edge. I want people to know that these horrible things happen to us all over the world. And a lot of the time people are silent about it, you know? Um, so that's kind of the 
that's why I think that this particular book is a is a good first start for people to really see what I can do with like a full length novel. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to people experiencing me writing like a longer work, um, you know, delving into more character development, um, just being freer. I think I think it's going to be a really interesting journey. And I'm so excited for all of the other novels that I have lined up that are coming out with Titan over the next couple of years. Now you've got so many things just come out or just about to come out. Yes. So exciting. Yeah. So listen, yeah. thank you so much for your time. I cannot thank you enough for your time. Thank you so much for the book. And thank you. Thank you so much for being such an open book today as well. I really appreciate it. And I, I wish you, I wish you all the best with the, with the the book when it comes out. And I wish you all the best with the novel when it comes out a little bit later on this year. And hopefully I get to speak to you about that once I've, uh, I've read it as well. That'd be fantastic. I would love that. And thank you so much for reading and being so kind. It really means a lot to me. That's thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time again. And I yeah, I wish you all the best of luck. Have a great day. Thank you, you too. All right, Bye. take care of yourself then. Bye now. Bye now. Bye.